Hi everyone, it's Amanda here. Welcome back to Yachting International Radio. And this is Inspirations with Amanda. And I'm really excited today. I'm introducing you to my friend, uh, Eddie Albert. We worked together in emergency medicine years ago. And since then, we've both gone off to do all sorts of incredible things. And Eddie's done some really amazing things. So he's a doctor and he works in extreme medicine, as you know, um, something I'm really passionate about. However, without further ado, Eddie, I'll let you introduce yourself. Who are you? Where are you? What are you doing? So thank you, Mandy. Yes, so I'm a, a medical doctor, perhaps with a difference. Um, from an Australian perspective, which is where I am now, I'm what's known as a rural or remote generalist. Uh, which is another way of saying a bit of a jack of all trades. Uh, but certainly, uh, we have worked for, in the Australian outback with Aboriginal folk. Uh, I've worked in the voluntary capacity in the Himalayas. I've worked down in Antarctica with our, our National Antarctic Research Program. And right now, I'm about as far away or far removed from where you are, Amanda, in that I'm, I'm actually in the biggest ski resort in the Southern Hemisphere, which, believe it or not, is in Australia. Australia. We do have mountains that go up to 2,200 metres. Uh, we have a, quite a few ski resorts and a lot of keen Aussie skiers. And normally people from around the world will come here and, and ski in the off season, as it were. Um, so, yeah, I work in the medical clinic here, fixing up, patching people who blow themselves up on the ski slopes, on their snowboards, or on their skis. Amazing. And I hear you've had a bit of a dump there recently. How's the snow? Yeah, I suppose if you're, if you're somewhere like Fernie or uh, Hokkaido, the idea of getting 95 centimetres of snow over three or four days really doesn't actually excite you. But when you live somewhere where it's relatively warm, mild sort of maritime influence on our mountains to get, get that sort of dump, uh, we're pretty excited. The snow's been so silky. I was back country yesterday. Uh, no, sorry, the day before yesterday, just on my own. Nobody else around. Some steep turns, first tracks, silky snow. It's like, this is amazing. So we, we get it sometimes. Yeah, we do. I love, love Perisher. And I think um, you're playing it down a bit. You also do some amazing work with uh, Flying Doctors. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I've spent a few years with the Royal Flying Doctors Service. So I guess for, for people around the world, um, there's not many first world countries, it's really only Australia and Canada, that have a kind of first world um, you know, sort of set up an income level and expectation of medical provision uh, that actually have their, their huge centres of population uh, you know, concentrated in relatively small areas. And then these vast areas of... Yeah, you could call it untouched wilderness. That's not quite right. Uh, but certainly you know, massive areas, very small remote populations, indigenous populations. We share a lot of similarities really with Canada, except they get more snow and it's really cold and dark. Uh, and our areas are just very, very hot and red and dusty. But the medicine's the same logistics. The Sorry, there was a delay. Keep going. Oh, I was going to say and the logistics are sort of the same and the difficulties of trying to provide a, a first world medical service into such remote areas uh, means it gets quite expensive uh, and, and certainly you need again quite a diverse skill set to be able to sort of fly out into the middle of nowhere and deal with whatever you're going to get. And what would be the most um, exciting rescue you've done with the flying or transportation um, that you've done with the flying doctors? Oh, the most exciting. I'm not really good at, like, you yeah, know, people always say, pick your favourite, this, pick your best, that, pick your... I'm not really, not really good at doing bests and favourites and worsts. I guess there's memorables, and perhaps two weeks into the, the job was a gentleman who was having a really low time, and he decided to end it all and shot himself in the chest, and as he did so, his foot, his big toe slipped off the trigger of his shotgun, uh, and he failed to kill himself. And about an hour and a half later, we were sort of landed. He had, he was a mess, put chest strains in, did what we could, uh, and flew him down to Perth. So bearing in mind, yeah, it's an hour and a quarter's flight in a fixed wing aircraft to get to him. 
and then from taking off, it was another two and a half hours flight to the nearest large hospital. Uh, and you know, within about 15 minutes of getting them there, he was in theatre. Cardiothoracic surgeons have opened it up, decompressed the bleeding around his heart, uh, and saved his life. And what was really nice was that he actually, you know, as he woke up, it was, oh, shit, I'm glad I'm alive. You know, I, this was a mistake. I really didn't mean to try and kill myself. That was a bad idea. So intervening like that and actually, you know, having really glad that we actually managed to save his life, that was pretty good. That's so cool. Yeah, that's what a good feeling. Amazing. And um, tell us about Antarctica. What was your position down there and how did you get there? How long were you there? What were you doing? Uh, I suppose appropriately, I got there on a ship. <laughs> I've been down a few times. The first couple of times we were just ship based scientific voyages. So on the Aurora Australis, which is shortly to be decommissioned, uh, it's been in service for a long time now, and we're getting a new a new icebreaker. Uh, but certainly a couple of marine science voyages, floating in amongst the ice, seeing all the wildlife, working with scientists and helping them on their projects. Because yeah, as you would know, you know if you prepare a crew, if you prepare a ship, uh, you get everything right before you even set off. There shouldn't be too much in the way of medical problems, you know, once you're underway. So working with, with, with friends that were scientists, that was really quite interesting. You know, for me as a doctor, getting to be involved in marine biology projects and, and seeing what they were doing was fabulous. And then a trip that was six months working at one of the stations. Uh, um, so sh again, shipped down and then last flight home. And then the last trip I did <clears throat> was actually more of a play trip on a, a uh, 70 meter yacht, uh, so a French, French designed aluminium centerboard yacht, uh, perfectly set up for, for getting down to Antarctica, perfectly set up for moving amongst the ice. Uh, I had a 40 day, 40 day trip, doing a bit of exploring, a bit of climbing, a bit of skiing, uh, even a bit of swimming and a bit of snorkeling. Wow, snorkeling in Antarctica. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it wasn't too bad actually. The dry suit, the neoprene hood, and my feet got a bit cold. But I was in the water for about forty minutes, and uh, yeah, saw a bit of a, a bit of sea life. There wasn't that much around where we were, but yeah, having having been on that that scientific voyage before and seen the actual incredible amount of sea life that's around the coast, you know, soft corals, sea pens, all these weird fish that we never knew existed. Uh, so my little snorkeling effort, I think I saw some starfish and a few mollusks and that was about it. A bit of seaweed and that was about it. No, no Japanese starfish, I hope. Uh, no, the whole crown of, the crown of thorns you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've seen crown of thorns before, uh, but no, not down there. <clears throat> I remember we got quite, we used to have to dive and get rid of them because there were so many around our sailing club in Hobart, mm. Tasmania, where I grew up. And what, um, what was the, any exciting injuries that you had to do with in Antarctica? What are the main, because we have a lot of super yachts going down there at the moment. Maybe not right mm. at the moment for obvious reasons, but every, every year more and more super yachts are heading down there. So what, what can you expect and, and what did you come across? So in terms of maritime traffic, there was actually quite a lot. And what was really quite clever was the, uh, the, the, the professional or um, you know, ch proper charter ships that were taking passengers down there uh, and how well scheduled they were. So you'd watch one pull out from around a, a headland and appear into the bay. And to them, it just seemed like well, there was only us there in our yacht and how cool and how remote. Yet only 15 minutes before we'd seen another big cruise ship slip out. So there's this amazing kind of like sort of sliding doors things of how, how they try to create an illusion of, of remoteness and, and, and how special it was for these people. Uh, whereas what we actually saw was this very cleverly crafted, stage manipulated uh, show of just boats moving in and out. So that, that, was, that was quite funny. Wow. Um, 
coming, coming, yeah, coming down to, I suppose you, you, you kind of keep focusing on the injuries, and it was a bit sad for myself and my wife. We were there to try and go climbing, and we, we climbed a peak. We think we might have been second or third ascent. doesn't really matter. Not that high, only about 750 metres off the above sea, but we'd got out of the dinghy from the yacht, immediately strapped crampons on on the beach, uh, and we're straight up. And we skinned up, we, we had a mountaineering boots, so instead of having normal skis, we had short blades. They're only about a metre long. They fix differently to a, what's effective as a mountaineering boot, not a rigid uh, ski boot. But we got to the top, great, looking all around. We could see the yacht, tiny, tiny pinprick below. And as we sort of set off, uh, my wife, Deb, caught an edge, went over and broke her ankle. Uh, so there we were, 50 metres below this peak with a broken ankle. And to me, I think two things, you can overcomplicate medicine in a remote environment, where you should actually be trying to simplify things. You know, exactly what she'd done didn't really matter. She just couldn't get up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, there's no x-rays, there's no diagnosis. It was can't get up. Ankle's probably broken. Yeah, that's all you really need to know. So the focus is then like, what do we do next? Not faffing around with the patient so much. And the other thing was the, the really the utility of having decent painkillers. And I know that's an issue in our modern society where we worry too much about people taking opiates and getting addicted. You know, but in this setting, giving a, a, a decent slug of intramuscular morphine uh, and then just getting on with, the, with dragging a backwards down the slope for the next three hours, um, readying onto the boat. We had some, you'll laugh about this, we had our, our rescue stretcher was from the Melbourne Toboggan Centre. And we had a couple of little toboggans that were about four feet long that we thought we could use as pulks, for putting our equipment on and dragging behind us. Or if we needed it, we had it. We had a rescue sled. Uh, so a couple of guys from my friend Dougie came off uh, uh, and they sort of met me at the bottom of the mountain and we popped her on that uh, and uh, dragged her back to the boat. I've still got some photographs of her sitting up uh, and in the background there's these um, Antarctic fur seals all sort of sitting up in the same sort of position. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a bit of a challenge. And then because we had a couple of folk, four, four folk were off on another island climbing, we were picking them up in five days' time. Uh, she was pretty stoic, just sat on the boat in a plaster. Uh, and you know, it was 10 days before we got back to a Ushuaia and then another couple before she had an operation. So I think it's, it comes down to just like, what's the problem? How do I fix the problem? Not overcomplicating it and just getting on with it. Yeah, really good advice because um, as you know, in marine medicine and in the super yacht, yeah. they're all very remote, you know, Patagonia, St George's Sound, the Northwest Passage, mm. Antarctica, Mid Atlantic, even, which for us we call yes. the middle ground. You know, we're back and forth all the time. You can be very remote out there. And um, while you were down there, was it, or was it another? And we were talking the other day about a tragedy where there was, a, was did a boat capsize or? Ah, uh, yes. So, uh, in, the, in the way that the world's often very small when you get into niche market stuff, and certainly the Antarctic yacht. Uh, and by yacht, I'm talking about, you know, we're talking about you know, yachts with masts and sails. You know, you're talking about vessels that are perhaps 55 to 80 feet long, maybe. Um, so proper yachts in the, in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, so, the, yes, unfortunately, we were... We were on our way back across Drake Passage and we we got a, a bit of a message that some friends of ours, them, their mother uh, and the skipper on that yacht, they were coming back from Falkland Islands. I forget where they're headed, it might have been Montevideo, I can't quite remember, but from just in South Georgia, Falkland Islands, heading back towards South America. Uh, and there's that term, you know, the, the, the term freak wave. Uh, when we actually all know that every thousandth wave is twice the significant wave height. So it's not really a freak wave, is it? Um, but anyway, they were in the back, they were in the cockpit, a uh, small cockpit in the back of the boat, uh, a couple of them peeling potatoes for dinner, uh, and the skipper and his girlfriends, this was the mother of the friend of ours, were washed overboard. The other lady who was a client on board the boat 
uh, slammed a head into the uh, into the metal stanchion or something around. I'm not sure something around the cockpit, and, but managed to stay in. Uh, and then, despite best efforts, they they turned around, started the engine, got the sails down, had, had motored back to sort of try and find them. They'd, and they'd they'd found the skipper, and they'd thrown the life raft overboard, and it deployed uh, as it should have done. Uh, and then they sort of went around again to try and come back and get to him. By the time they came back, he wasn't anywhere to be seen. Uh, and she was certainly long gone. So it was really quite a tragic, uh, tragic event. And I guess it, it, you know, it reminds us that when, whenever you set off and you go somewhere like that, there isn't actually a guarantee that you're coming home. You know, we think we live in this world where everything's automated, everything's guaranteed. You go to the supermarket, you buy your bread, you go to the petrol station, you, you know, buy your petrol, everything's on demand, give them a credit card. But yet, you know, when you get on a boat like that and you go to places like that, nothing's actually guaranteed. And it was it was quite sobering coming back into Ushuaia. And again, all, all the yachts are all lined up in, in, in the yacht club. And the amount of the, the collegiality and, and the kind of support, that emotional support and the sort of friendship between essentially rival yachts because it, you know they're they're all they're all operating on on getting punters getting passengers to take down there yeah, but yeah you know when times are tough everyone's pulling together and you know the amount of the tears and the, that was shared the wine that was drunk um it was quite a yeah, it was quite a difficult time especially as my wife was in hospital having her ankle broken so uh, yes yeah yeah thanks for sharing i think it's good for us to remember that you, you know, we're, we're all in a high risk industry and these things, and the, it's beautiful because we get to explore these amazing places. But I like the way you put it so well that, you know, <laughs> there is a risk when you run away from the automated lifestyle, I guess, you know, that unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's not always that way. But what a way to go <laughs> as well. You yeah. know? <laughs> At least if you go in the water there, it's, it's going to be quick. At least you're not going to be bobbing around in the Atlantic for hours, you know, waiting for the rescue. Yeah, in a sense, I think both of them... Yeah, I think both were in the late 60s or early 70s. I can't quite remember. And it was sort of like, well, yeah, at least they've had a good life. And it was like, no, I don't want to die in my late 60s. No, that's not, that's not good enough. Um, but I guess they died doing what they loved. Exactly. I've got, um, I know a lot of friends that don't wear life jackets in the Southern Ocean because if, when they go in, they want it to be forever. You know, they just think, well, if I'm going in, I'm going in. What do you mm. think about that? Um, it's, it's all pretty context dependent, isn't it? Because if it's, if it's blue, flat, calm, and you go in, that's probably when you've got the best chance of actually a boat coming around and fit, fit, fixing you. But it's also the last chance, you know, the, the slight lowest chance you've got of falling in in the first place. It's also the light, it's probably when you probably wouldn't have a life jacket on. Um, yeah, tethers, I guess, are the other issue, aren't they? If you're going up onto the foredeck and things are pretty rough, we had one downwind sail where, uh, where the wind really picked up beyond what we expected and, um, for some reason, and I, I, I wasn't, you know, it's not my, my yacht, I wasn't in charge, but for some reason we didn't have any lanyards or any tethers on, on, on board the boat. And so a friend and I were sort of going forward in sort of 45 knot winds, uh, trying to sort of get the mainsail down, headsail, everything wrapped up, so we were just on bare poles. We didn't have life jackets on, but geez, I was definitely in the moment. I was definitely very, very focused on what I was doing and the moves I was making. Um, so I don't know to what extent we have these artificial things that then maybe give us a bit of complacency. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Things, things are never that simple. They're never that black and white as they are when they're seen on a TV show, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So on another topic, you are doing some really exciting work with the University of Tasmania launching um, some... Uh, grad dips and master's degrees in extreme medicine and extreme sports from a medical perspective, which could be really exciting for so many people watching this episode because 
hopefully everyone that's watching today that's a yachty has done their medical support <laughs> course, medical care on board ships, mm, or at least medical ships, care. Yeah. Therapy. So what we do is we train yachties to be doctors. But what you're doing is, and we're doing, is teaching doctors to be adventurers and be able to be leaders and medics in hostile and extreme environments, which could be so valuable for us as yachties because I, I really believe that in the near future, we're gonna need many boats that we look after, uh, having hospitals and needing doctors to be on board. I'm getting called every week asking to you know find a, a doctor for a super yacht. And there's definitely going to be a job opening there for many soon. If not every, I see in the future, every super yacht will require a medic, whether it's a paramedic or on the larger super yachts, you know, the, the mega yachts, they have <coughs> dentists, they have operating theatres. Um, one boat I was on fitting out recently had three oxy logs, for those of you that don't know what they are, they're ventilators. Um, they were, you know, they had an operating theatre plus a dentist, they had the whole works. And um, more than we have in rural Australia and many rural places I've been. So, you know, there's going to be, you know, a lot of a lot, lot of need for doctors on boats. But can you tell us a little bit about the course that you're running at the moment and what people are going to get out of that course? Because there could be some doctors in the, and nurses and paramedics that are interested as well. Yeah, so, sure. So it, it, it's interesting. Saying about you know the extent of uh, your medical capacities on on ships, I guess the whole program really arose from working with Australian Antic Antarctic Division, and going back some sort of 10, 15 years, it was getting to the point where it was actually very difficult to recruit. And Jeff Aiden, the boss, uh, the boss doctor down there, yeah, you know, we we sort of put our heads together and thought this is all about training. It's about recognition. Uh, it's about yeah. You know, giving giving people sort of something else. Um, so we kind of ended up putting a program together that's sort of slowly grown. And from the from the outset, I was very keen it should be multidisciplinary. Because when you look at how healthcare is provided in different remote and extreme environments, it, it involves not just doctors, it involves nurses, paramedics. You know, paramedics taking an extended role into providing essentially sort of general practice type stuff. Equally, equally with nurses taking a role out into that sort of pre-hospital environment, plus providing sort of ongoing care. You know, doctors having to actually get their hands dirty and, and, and be able to sort of function outside of a hospital. So we sort of built a program that sort of recognised and showcases some of what the Australian Antarctic Division does. It's been very good over the years at improving and its support for its ship or ships and for its bases. You know, the telemedicine setups, uh, you mentioned operating theatres, training people, training the plumber and the cook and the diesel mechanic to be sort of theatre assistants. So, so look, looking at some of what they were doing and then extrapolating that. So we, we, we try and teach people to function in, in um, not just cold, but hot environments, uh, high altitude, maritime, aerospace. And you know, from only a few short years ago, the whole space thing's taken off internationally. And certainly in Australia, we now have a space agency. So we run a course in, in uh, space medicine. And as you mentioned, extreme sports. So going back to when I was a kid, yeah, the, the name didn't exist. Uh, but now when you look at what people are actually doing, you know, it, ocean racing is obviously one, one example, uh, but also, the base jumping, wind tuning, big mountain skiing, uh, big wave surfing. And you know, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of crossovers in the, the attitudinal stuff, uh, the, the approaches that you need as, as, a, a, as a medic, as a caregiver. But also there's some very sort of specialist stuff. So we're trying to teach in a partly online environment, but also very much in face-to-face -face intensive uh, settings of getting people together, trying to form them very quickly into teams that can can function and respond. And particularly, particularly the doctors, uh, trying to actually get their hands out of their pockets to get them to actually do stuff. Uh, it's often really quite interesting on the expedition medicine courses we run, where nurses are used to moving patients, paramedics are used to just getting on with it because their patients aren't neatly packaged. 
uh, but particularly for the doctors to go, yeah, you actually need to do something. Your knowledge is not sufficient. You actually need to apply it and you actually need to focus on what's important uh, as opposed to not what's in, as opposed to what's not important and actually get something done. So often it's, the medicine can be quite simple. You might have to draw on some specialist knowledge for different environments, but it's often very much about problem solving and being very practical. Um, so I suppose I've been prattling on a bit, but that's basically what we're doing. No, it's absolutely perfect and so relevant as well because I find it really interesting the more I've been thinking about it, the role reversal of um, teaching. I find teaching, I've taught nurses and doctors and paramedics um, advanced life support and now I'm teaching the yachties, um, you know, medicine and they're also proactive except, you know, I guess we have a couple of captains those of you that are watching probably know who I'm talking about. Um, and one of my funniest examples of, you know, hands in pockets was I said to a very good friend of mine that's a very famous captain one day, Captain, could you get the medical kit, please? And he turned to the chief stewardess and said, Chief stewardess, go and get the medical kit. And um, <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious and very well played. And, um, yeah, so I, I, um, I find the yachties really easy to teach because they're so used to being hands-on and really really busy and yeah. i find it quite interesting when i go back to teaching in a hospital environment that you know that sometimes they're not as proactive as maybe the yachties that are used to being in hostile environments in extreme environments and thinking on their feet and having to make things up as they go along you know make a stretcher out of two deck brushes and a and a wet weather jacket or something like that. Yeah, so. Um, but I think your students are think... in demand in this industry, that's for sure. Yeah, I just think two, you made me think of two things. One is I, I kind of I have some sympathy for the captain because one of the things that we do teach is that whole, you know, what came out of the aviation industry, perhaps, you know, in the late 70s, 80s, this whole what became cockpit and then crew, or we call it crisis resource management. So that overarching leadership. So sometimes we do want people with their hands in their pockets with a big picture view. Yeah. And then the other thing I sort of thought about was as our modern society is getting you know, more and more bureaucratically driven, more and more rules and regulations, seeing, you know, I, I had an email from a friend of mine who's uh, the medical director for a ski patrol outfit in Northern Tasmania. It's only a small um, ski area. Uh, and then finding that some bureaucrat who runs the national parks is actually in control of what medical care is and isn't delivered when. Uh, and the, the sort of situation of, well, the ski patrollers are only ski patrollers when the lifts are running. And if the lifts are running, they're ordinary people. If they're ordinary people, they can't use the medications that they can use when they're ski patrollers. And they had the situation of a lady who fell uh, and slipped the ski, you know, there some ski patrollers there, they had their medical kits, uh, and they were banned from using their skills because they weren't effect, they weren't legally ski patrollers because the lifts weren't running. So it, 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 something that could have been dealt with very simply sucked up several police cars, a couple of ambulances, uh, and had this lady in quite a lot of pain for sort of four hours. So we're, you know, we're finding young doctors, paramedics, nurses are, are kind of born and growing up in this sort of perverted society where people are afraid to do the right thing in case they do the wrong thing or are not allowed, told they're not allowed to do the right thing. Um, so we're having to not only get people and train them in this environment, we're having to give them a whole new mindset about what's possible and what should be done. And it contradicts what they're told you know, in the rest of their lives. So interesting, because that's something I find, you know, I've got to keep pointing out to people here as well that, if, you know, I'm a nurse in Australia and England in the UAE, but when I'm in Spain and on the dock on a boat, I'm the same as the crew. And it's only mm. if I become come on the crew list and get appointed and and still then, you know, I I don't have any more skills because so often people are asking me to help with things like that. And it can be really frustrating at times if you are being overrun and I know the mountain you're talking about and it is very remote up there. You know, it's a big windy road and it's not always possible to drive mm. it. So had it been anything more serious, it could have been quite, you know, quite a tragedy really if it was an, you know, a heart attack or something. And I think 
with the legalities too, people are so scared, you know, so something that comes up in my courses is, you know, because we have so many medicines on the boats, as you know, that we're allowed to take around the world, but are only, you know, used offshore. And for anything else, we're, we're supposed to take them to a local hospital, which often yeah. might be outfitted with the supplies we have. You know, the hospital I took a friend to in Vanuatu didn't even have sheets for the beds, you know. And it, once again, we're coming down to this legal framework of are we allowed to assist or not, you know. And when the students I teach on yachts have all this training and they've done a couple of weeks of really intensive practice and... They can rattle off all the drugs we use. They know how to use their kits really well. They have quite sufficient kits in their car and they come across a bike accident, you know, we, which we come across regularly here in Mallorca where I'm based. And they're not able to really give, give assistance in, in the way they're trained because we train them in remote medicine, which is beyond basic first aid. And so it's always having to remind them that when we're training them for the boats, that we're... Um, only training them for remote marine medicine offshore. And we have to constantly remind them that when they're on the dock or when they're at the nightclub, that they are only able to do basic first aid and, and call for help, no matter what they see. Mm. Yeah. So one last thing, how do you get your head into leadership? If you're in a really crazy environment, say, let's use the ankle because dealing with a loved one, many of us are in that situation when we're on boats, we work really closely together and we've been together for years. How did you cope um, and how do you cope when you're in you know, small groups of people that you've been training with for expeditions and someone gets injured? How do you get back in the game and get that medical hat on, so to speak, to deal with the situation pragmatically? Well, I think there's probably a, a, at a few levels. I mean, clearly you've got to have the knowledge skill set, but then beyond that, it's, it's, and that's often a relatively simple thing. And I think it's, it's around being calm. Um, so I, after I did my training, did my rural general practice training in Scotland, I ended up being in an academic jobs for a while, long story short, I hadn't done much acute medicine, much emergency stuff for a few years. And I decided, uh, actually, I wanted to go back into that. And I had some anxiety about that. And, yeah, I wasn't lying awake at night. But it was sort of, well, you know, when you, it, it, you, know, when you see somebody who's short of breath, sweaty, you know, things looking like pretty icy, it does get your heart rate up. Or I guess, you know, you can, you can extend that into a, a setting on a ship or a cliff face or, you know, there's enough going on that it gets part of a deliberate decision that I would always pretend to be calm and always pretend to know what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and I, I, think, I think that's that, that sort of worked well is to deliberately portray this sense of calm outwardly. It, it, it makes everybody else around you much calmer. It creates some space. You know, there's rarely anything that needs to be done right now. You know, there's, there's not much in them that can't wait a few minutes. Um, and I remember doing some training when the Royal Flying Doctors, every year we'd have to do some simulations, a uh, simulated patient maybe out on a cattle station or a small remote nursing post. Um, and they'd make them really hard. I remember... I was with one, one nurse uh, who was pretending to be the, she was the trainer, pretending to be the remote area nurse. We had the plastic mannequin uh, doing whatever he or she was doing, trying desperately to die. I remember in the feedback, you know, the doctor that was running it said, you know, you're, you're incredibly calm. And, and it's, it's not necessarily because I knew exactly what I was doing all the time, or not necessarily because I felt calm, but if you can actually exude that calmness, it you know, buys you some space, makes other people behave differently, they behave better. Uh, and I think it works really well. So that deliberately cultivating calmness, I think would be one big message for anybody. Love it, absolutely, yeah. I come back to the Dr. ABC there, just in a mindset way. 
you know, deep mm. agenda, don't flip out. <laughs> Just keep it together. I have a breath you know, ah, am I going to respond or react, you know, and just, you know, and I, I, I find just saying that Dr. ABC for me just helps me just stop, breathe and have a moment to, as you so beautifully say, just, you know, give out the calm. Yeah. I think, I think maybe that I don't know, but the people you've taught might say one way or another, but maybe there's a sense that somehow you and I as professionals, know something different and do something different and that somehow this Dr. ABC nonsense is what we teach everybody else but we have some secret stuff that we do yeah and you're quite right we don't uh, and when things are getting difficult or you can't quite understand why things aren't going the way you expect them to or if you're not getting the improvement you expect from your treatment that's exactly what you do you go right back to the beginning and go okay where are we at with a where are we at with b where yeah and we do that all, we do that all the time it is real it's not just what we teach other people yeah such a such a good reminder for everyone and um and a reminder that you know nurses and doctors especially doctors are human too and we actually have to mm -hmm. consciously say okay this could get heavy you know, there's huge waves coming over. It's blowing 60 knots and we're in 12 metre seas and someone's just broken their femur. It, nothing has to happen in one minute. Let's just stop, make it calm yes. and, and do this together, you know, and, and calm the farm. And I can't emphasise mm -hmm. that enough to students is, you know, it's the same when we go into a manoeuvre sailing, you know, you can be on a boat where everyone yells or you can be on a quiet boat. And the quiet boat's always a lot more powerful and a lot more pleasant. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks so much, Eddie. I know you've got powder to ski tomorrow yeah. and lives to save in the snow. Well, hopefully not, that you have to be at the hospital. Um, so thanks so much for coming yeah. on the show. It's been really good having you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. So everyone, this is Eddie Albert from Parish of Valley um, in the snow in Australia. And you've been watching Inspirations with Nanda on Yachting International Radio. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.